Hello student, welcome back to your physics teacher. Uh, today we're looking at section 8.3 from the Nelson textbook. And in this we're going to be looking at some of the properties of waves and how they relate to the graphs. So the first question that we're going to do, they wanted us to copy this figure into our notebook, but you should do it for your notes and here I'm just going to use the screen. Now from this figure, they want us to label the amplitude, the wavelength, and equilibrium point of the waveform. So the amplitude gives you the maximum displacement from equilibrium of the particle. And in this case, we need to first recognize where the equilibrium line is going to be then. So in this case, we see that the wave is moving to the right, but the displacement is going up and down. But this is a snapshot, so it's just at one given moment in time. So we recognize that at one specific moment in time, the maximum displacement is given by the three points I just put in pink. So those are the maximum displacements, and then the maximum displacement is measured from the equilibrium line, which is what we call the amplitude. And this means that the equilibrium line is going to be along this axis here. So we could label the green line as the equilibrium line. Okay, so there we got two. And to recognize the wavelength, a wavelength looks at one complete wave cycle. Because in waves, we say that they are repeating themselves in cycles. So we want to look at this and see when one pattern of the cycle begins to repeat. One quick way to do this is just to look at the two maximas. So this means that the positive maximum displacement to the next positive maximum displacement. And that will be the wavelength. Keep in mind that the wavelength can occur at any points that repeat themselves in the cycle of the wave which I'm going to get to in the part B, because in part B it says list all pairs of points that are in phase. Another way of saying this is recognize the points that are a full wavelength apart. So whenever they ask you to find points that are in phase, in other words, points that are whole wavelength apart. Now, we identify between the very maximum positive displacements but that was not one of the options because they wanted us to recognize from the points A, X, B, C, D, E, F, G, Y, H. So the points that are going to be in phase, we have to consider two at a time. So in this case, A and E are really good candidates. And that's a full wavelength. And it appears that B to F is another wavelength. So here we have A and E, and we also have B and F. What could be of better use is to recognize which ones will not be in phase. And here I'm going to consider the point E and H. So although they share the same displacement from the equilibrium line, notice that a full wave cycle has not yet occurred because a full wave cycle usually for simple waves think of the sine wave. So you need to look for a complete sine wave or a cosine wave cycle. So from E to H, you only have more or less half a wave cycle. So that's another way to recognize which points are in phase. If you can see that a full wave cycle apart between the points, then they are a wavelength apart, which means they are in phase. Now, I did make a small mistake. I realized that they asked us for the equilibrium point and not the equilibrium line. So from part A, we could go back and fix that up. So we notice that the points X and Y are actually at equilibrium because they lie on the equilibrium line. So I should have been more correct on that part.
for question two, they want us to contrast wavelength and amplitude for longitudinal waves and transverse waves. Okay, so first here we have the longitudinal wave and a transverse wave. And we want to first identify the wavelength and the amplitude. So what exactly do they give us for their information? Well, if we are looking at first transverse waves, those are, are more easier to look at. We're going to have the vertical displacement, which is y. And since they're asking for wavelength, this has to be a function of x. So not as a function of time, function of x. And the wavelength is just a full wave cycle. So we call this the wavelength. So all the wavelength is is a full wave cycle. So in other words, how much distance it takes in the medium itself for the cycles to begin to repeat themselves. So in this case, the wavelength tells you the distance along the medium that it takes for one cycle to occupy at an instant in time. And if we're looking at the transverse wave, so that's the wavelength, and the amplitude just gives you the maximum displacement from the equilibrium line at a single moment in time in this case. So here the amplitude just gives you the maximum displacement from equilibrium. But longitudinal is a bit different because remember for longitudinal we have areas of compression and rarefaction. And we can also look at instead of the number of particles we look at the pressure. So in this case, the amplitude just gives you the highest pressure, and the wavelength, once again, gives you the full wave cycle distance that it takes up at a given moment in time. So instead of the looking at displacement, we looked at pressure. So that's the main difference between the two. So in this case, the amplitude gives you the maximum pressure. Difference. And then the wavelength just gives you the distance that it takes up for one complete cycle in the medium itself. So in this case, it's between the two peaks of the pressure. So that's one way you can recognize it. So between the compression compression points. Question three, in your own words, distinguish between wave speed and frequency. So here recall that we have a formula that actually connects these two together. So wave speed is the frequency times the wavelength. And furthermore, we have a formula for frequency, which is 1 over the period. Okay, so see, we, we can see how they are really connected. They are in the same formula, but that's not really that helpful, right? So now let's look at frequency, because frequency is more commonly confused. So frequency is 1 over the period. One way you can think about this is how many repetitions occur in one second of time. By repetitions, I mean cycles. This is why you have the 1 on top of this formula, so 1 second. And remember, t, t stands for period, which is the time that it takes to make one cycle. So if you really think about this together now, in one second, how many cycles occur? Because period is one cycle, so in one second, how many cycles occur? This is the frequency. So if you have five hertz, then you have five cycles occurring in one second. If you have 300 hertz, you have 300 cycles occurring in one second. So it tells you the number of repetitions that are occurring in one second. But the speed, the speed is telling you how quickly energy is moving in that particular medium.
Now you can think of this as lambda or the period which is going to be having units of meters over seconds. So in other words, it tells you the distance cover by this wave in one second of time because if we recall this is what meters per second means so if you want to think about an example let's say you have 30 meters per second then this means 30 meters are covered in one second but if we think about frequency and let's say we have 30 Hertz then this means that there are 30 wave cycles in one second. Right, because the units of hertz is cycles per second. So that, that's how these two can be compared between uh, the two values. So let's look at the next question now. Make a sketch that shows two identical transverse waveforms except one waveform is phase shifted one half a wavelength from the other. So first let's draw a transverse wave and we're going to put it as a function of x because uh, the phase shift is t telling you about the distance values in this case. Or it could be time, but let's just deal with distance, it's easier. And as you might have noticed by now, these waves just take on the sinusoidal form, so a sine wave. And we said that if it's shifted one half a wavelength, and this is a full wavelength, so a half a wavelength, you move it half as much. So in this case, the yellow line got shifted a half wavelength to the right and it could be to the right or to the left so it doesn't make much of a difference because they didn't specify right but the point is that the cycle now it got shifted half a wavelength you could think about transformations to make it a little bit easier for yourself if you're taking math and this is the yellow line right the sine wave starts at zero at the origin and if we're going to shift this to to the right what would the graph look like? The equation? Well, the amplitude stays the same. Kx remains the same. So the frequency stays the same. But since we're shifting to the right, we put a minus, think back to transformations, and usually it's given this Greek letter. And technically, we did half a wavelength. So we can simplify this. Right, so that's one way to think about it. So we shifted it half a wavelength to the right. Question five, make a sketch that shows two identical longitudinal waveforms, except one waveform is a phase, shifted one half wavelength from the other. So same as above. Right, so this is a full wave cycle. So then if we shift it half to the right, what would that look like? It's really hard to see, but one way to think about it is the compressions where they occur in the original are now occurring where the rarefactions are in the second. Wait, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah so the compression area in the original is now the rarefaction area in the second. And the rarefaction in the original is now the compression in the second. Okay, that makes more sense. Oh, that was it. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. I hope this was helpful. Uh, maybe I didn't explain something well enough. Just put a comment and I'll answer the questions.